In April of 1814, a momentous era spanning a full decade had seen the remarkable ascendancy of one man across the European landscape. This man was none other than Napoleon Bonaparte, who, with his unparalleled military genius, had steered France to unprecedented heights of power. Under his command, the French Empire had stretched its dominion across the continent, yet, as the calendar turned, the tides of destiny were shifting, the curtain was descending on his reign. The grand stage of Europe witnessed a dramatic turning point. The epoch of Napoleon's reign was drawing to a close as a coalition of formidable adversaries united against him. His grip on power weakened, and he was left with no choice but to abdicate his throne, a symbolic relinquishment of his imperial might. Exiled to the remote confines of the island of Elba, he found himself confined to a patch of land far removed from the grandeur he once commanded. In an unforeseen twist of fate, the Bourbon monarchy made its resurgence in France. The corporeal embodiment of this restored rule came in the form of Louis XV, an emblem of the past. However, the aura of inevitability that surrounded this restoration was tainted by the whispers that drifted through the air. Murmurs of a disenchanted populace, the French people, it seemed, were not quite prepared to embrace the old order once more. The echoes of a turbulent history still reverberated through the hearts of the people, memories of excesses, of a monarchy that had danced upon the precipice of the revolution, remained etched in their collective consciousness. The monarchy's return appeared to be more a concession to the whims of the international political landscape than a true reflection of the will of the people. The seeds of restlessness had been sown, and the winds of change were stirring. Amidst the corridors of power at the Congress of Vienna, Napoleon's enemies were locked in a convoluted dance of diplomacy. Disagreements and discord permeated the air as they grappled with the weighty question of Europe's destiny. Here was the crucible where the future of the continent was being forged, and Napoleon knew it. He seized upon this moment of fragility, recognizing the fractures within the coalition. A mere ten months into his exile, he embarked on a journey that would reverberate through history. His triumphant return to France was marked not by the sounds of marching soldiers, but by a resounding chorus of hope that emanated from the hearts of those who yearned for change. The very troops dispatched to apprehend him found themselves swayed by the aura of his charisma. The French soil, it appeared, still bore the seeds of loyalty he had sown. The tide of popular sentiment began to surge in his favor, as news spread, like wildfire on a dry plain. Of his resurgence, the spirit of defiance took root. Ordinary citizens, weary of the shadows cast by the monarchy, saw in Napoleon a flicker of a future that could be different, a future that resonated with their aspirations for equality and empowerment. The corridors of power in Paris soon found themselves at odds with the pulse of the streets. But in Vienna, where the cobblestones were far removed from the French soil, the reaction was swift and decisive. The coalition, realizing the potential danger posed by Napoleon's return, cast aside their differences and united against a common foe. In their eyes, he was not merely a former ruler, he was now an outlaw, a renegade whose very existence threatened the precarious balance they had sought to establish. As Napoleon stepped onto the stage of defiance, he was well aware of the challenges he faced, the tide of public sentiment could be a fickle companion, and the road ahead was fraught with uncertainty. The coalition, with its shared enmity for him, marshaled its forces for a war that would determine the course of history. Napoleon's gamble was one of audacity, a wager that the spark of revolution still glowed within the hearts of the French people, a spark that could be fanned into a conflagration. His strategy was one of calculated risk, a gambit that hinged on exploiting the divisions within the coalition. With a razor-sharp focus, he set his sights on the coalition armies that were within his reach. The Prussian army, led by Prince Blücher, and the Anglo-Allied forces commanded by the Duke of Wellington were his immediate targets. Each of these forces posed a formidable challenge, yet Napoleon's vision was singular, to keep them apart and defeat them one by one. As he stood at the crossroads of destiny, Napoleon's mind was a whirlwind of tactics and calculations. The battlefield was not just a physical space, it was a canvas upon which he would paint his comeback. Charleroi became the threshold of his return, a symbolic gateway to a new era. With strategic brilliance, he sought to drive a wedge between the coalition forces, isolating them from each other and diminishing their combined might. The very fabric of history seemed to quiver as the French countryside bore witness to the unfolding drama, the clash of ideologies, the collision of ambitions, these were the forces that converged on the canvas of Charleroi. 
On one side, Napoleon, the once and future emperor, marshaled his forces, intent on shaping the destiny that had slipped through his fingers. On the other side, the coalition, representing a united front of old regimes and new hopes, stood poised to repel his advance. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting its golden hue upon the battlefield, the stakes could not have been higher. The fates of nations hung in the balance, and the path to victory was shrouded in uncertainty. The stage was set for a clash that would resonate through the annals of history, a clash where the past and the future collided in a dance of destiny. The winds of change were blowing, and the echoes of a fallen empire were about to be drowned out by the thunderous roar of battle. As the sun began to set on that fateful day, the cavalry engagements continued to unfold with a sense of inexorable inevitability. The sight of mounted soldiers circling each other, swords glinting in the waning light, was a poignant reflection of the overarching stalemate that had gripped the battlefield. Ney's inability to provide critical infantry and artillery support to his cavalry charge underscored the complexities of battlefield command. Amidst the chaos, the cries of both horses and men merged into an eerie symphony of warfare. In another corner of the battlefield, the Prussian forces, under the seasoned leadership of Blücher, enacted a strategic masterstroke. Their capture of Plansenoit sent ripples of concern through Napoleon's command. The village not only threatened his flank but also forced him to make the difficult decision of diverting reserves to regain control. This shift in focus highlighted the dynamic nature of warfare, where every tactical decision could ripple across the battlefield, determining the course of the battle. As twilight descended, the French infantry's hard-fought capture of La Haye Saint marked a turning point in the battle's dynamics. With this strategic foothold secured, the French could now bring their artillery to bear on the tightly packed Allied squares. The stage was set for a deadly confrontation. As artillery shells tore through the ranks of soldiers, the once-ordered formations were transformed into a nightmarish tableau of chaos and destruction. The human toll was unfathomable, and as the sun dipped below the horizon, the weight of history seemed to rest heavily upon the shoulders of those involved. The relentless march of time contrasted starkly with the fleeting nature of human life on the battlefield. Soldiers, once vibrant and full of life, found themselves caught in a maelstrom of death and destruction. Amidst the unfolding tragedy, the sense of desperation on both sides intensified. Napoleon, realizing the gravity of his situation, was faced with the grim reality of his diminishing manpower. His decision to deploy the elite Imperial Guard was a last-ditch effort to turn the tide. The moment they stepped onto the battlefield, it was as though the very spirit of their reputation walked with them an aura of invincibility that had struck fear into the hearts of their enemies. However, as the Guard faced the unrelenting musket fire of Wellington's forces, the brutal reality of battle shattered the illusion of invulnerability. The clash of bayonets and the eruption of gunfire painted a vivid portrait of the desperation on both sides. The battlefield, which had witnessed so much valor and sacrifice, now saw a gut-wrenching tableau of lives hanging in the balance. In a cruel twist of fate, the Imperial Guard faltered and retreated, a moment that marked the culmination of a day of brutal struggle. The echoes of that retreat reverberated through the French ranks, igniting panic that spread like wildfire. Chaos erupted, transforming the once orderly formations into a chaotic sea of disarray. The field that had been the site of such determined contest was now the scene of a desperate flight for survival. As the dust began to settle, the realization of defeat settled in. Napoleon's forces were in disarray, and the Prussian cavalry's pursuit was a relentless reminder of the price of failure. Even Napoleon himself, who had once held the fate of nations in his grasp, found himself on the brink of capture. The commander who had once shaped Europe's destiny was now on the run. The final moments of the battle carried an air of somber resolution. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher, victors on this blood-soaked field, met outside an inn that bore witness to their shared triumph. Their exchange of congratulations was tinged with a complex mix of emotions, relief, respect, and the sobering recognition of the sacrifices that had been made. The aftermath of Waterloo was a tableau of both triumph and tragedy. The field was strewn with the fallen, a grim testament to the brutality of war. The cost of victory was steep, measured in lives forever altered by the relentless march of conflict. The wounded, left unattended due to the dire lack of medical resources, lay as a poignant reminder of the harsh realities of warfare. For Napoleon, Waterloo spelled the end of an era, his defeat left him without recourse, and surrender became his only option. 
transported once again into exile, the confines of St. Helena became his final prison. This remote outpost in the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean became a symbol of his fall from grace, and it was here that he would draw his last breath. In the broader context, Waterloo marked a significant turning point for Europe. The conflict's conclusion ushered in an era of relative tranquility, as the great powers refrained from waging war against each other for four decades. The British, who had once been embroiled in continental conflicts, were now absent from the fray for a century. For decades after the battle, the advent of photography unveiled poignant images that transcended time. These veterans of Napoleon's legions, their faces etched with the passage of years, emerged as living embodiments of history. Sergeant Tanya, Moray, and Berlin in names that had once resonated with youthful vigor now bore the weight of years, their faces becoming a portal to the past. In these aged countenances, one could glimpse the echoes of a bygone era, the clatter of hooves, the roar of cannon fire, and the clash of bayonets. These men, once youthful warriors of a tumultuous age, now stood as a living testament to the battles that shaped the destiny of nations. The wrinkled lines on their faces, etched by time and experience, told stories that stretched far beyond the confines of a single battlefield. Their existence bridged the gap between past and present, a poignant reminder that the course of history is shaped by the sacrifices of those who came before.